Hello, welcome to Investment Essentials, part of Humanities 130, Society and Finance. So before we begin, you know, when we talk about all kinds of financial malfeasance, it's, un, it's essential to understand the terminology, the what, the products that are being used to manipulate society. So the stock market is one of the largest of these vehicles. So we want to start off talking about stocks. Stocks represent ownership in a company. And what that does is it basically gives you the right to earnings and you get earnings through uh, dividends, which we'll talk about in a lot more detail in a few minutes, and assets if the company fails. Now, the reality is, of course, if a company is failing, uh, there's not going to be much left to divvy up. So really, the earnings is the major part of that. You'll also hear the words equity or shares used to refer to stock. And the dividends, as I mentioned, are from the profits. Now, you own one share of Disney stock. They give you a $3 dividend. Well, you're going to get $3. But consider this, let's say that you have a thousand shares. Well, that's $3,000. So the more shares you own, the more of the profit you'll get. An important characteristic of stock is the fact that it's limited liability, which means that as an owner of the stock, you are not personally liable if the company is not able to pay its debt. So for example, if a company goes out of business, the People who are owed money can't show up at your house and say, hey, you have one share of Disney stock, you owe me your house. The maximum value you can lose is the value of your investment. Uh, stockholders are also known as shareholders. And the one benefit is that each share of stock gives you a vote in electing the board of directors. Now, again, keep in mind that if you have that one share of Disney stock, that's not going to give you the kind of control that if you owned a million shares of stock. So what does the board of directors actually do? They are a group of individuals who are elected to act as representatives of the stockholders to establish management policies and to make decisions on major company issues. So for example, they help set broad goals. They hire and fire the high level executives like the CFO, which is the chief financial officer, the CEO, the chief executive officer, and so forth. They ostensibly are supposed to support the executives in their duties. And they do this by ensuring the company has adequate resources at its disposal. And lastly, they manage those resources efficiently. So, how do you become a director? Wouldn't that be a cool job? The problem is you have to be nominated. And most directors are experienced business people who have demonstrated excellent business judgment. So I have some examples of directors board of director members um, here. The first gentleman on the left is Reed Hastings. He serves on the board of Facebook and he's also the CEO of Netflix. Uh, the gentleman in the middle is Al Gore. He is the former vice president of the United States under Bill Clinton and is a member of the Apple board. Uh, the woman all the way to the right is Dr. Judith Roden. She served as president of the University of Pennsylvania and she is also a Comcast board member. So how do we make money with stocks? There's basically two ways of doing this. One, and as we discussed, the dividends. It's the portion of a company's profits that are distributed by the company. Now there's a couple issues with dividends. One, a lot of companies, even if they are making a big profit don't always give out dividends. They may have a large project they want to invest up a lot of money in, such as building a new um, oil platform, 
in the ocean or investing in new technologies. So, you know, the dividend thing is great for big investors because they're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of shares. But for the average person, the way we make money is as the stock price increases, we sell it as a personal profit. So, for example, let's say you buy stock in a company for $20 a share. In five years, the price has jumped to $45 a share. You decide that this is a good time to sell. So you sell all of your shares and you basically make a $25 profit on each share of stock you sell. That is the way ostensibly that most of us, again the average person, is going to make money in the stock market. So let's back up a minute and think why would a company want to sell stock? Well essentially they want to sell stock to raise money and when they first go to the stock market when the company says hey let's get on the stock market they call that the initial public offering and it's called an IPO and you hear that word IPO on a pretty regular basis because this is how smart young people who start companies make billions of dollars. In 2004, Google went public and their IPO shares originally sold for $85 a share. They closed that first day at $100 a share. Now let's fast forward 12 years and at the beginning of 2016, their shares were trading at $690 a share. So if you had invested on day one at $85 a share, you would have made $605 per share of stock. So, you know, obviously for a lot of people, the idea is to find a stock that they believe will have. So then the question becomes, how do you find those kinds of awesome, potentially profit bringing stocks? Well, you engage in the game of risk, and you're not taking over Madagascar. In fact, risk is defined as the probability of losing your investment. So you want to think of investing in the stock market like gambling. So the higher the risk, the higher the potential reward, and the higher the risk, the more likely you will lose your investment. So high risk, high reward, high risk, probability of not getting any reward. By becoming an owner of a piece of stock, you assume the risk of the company not being successful. But you also have the potential to make a much higher rate of return than your average savings account, which hovers in the area of 1% these days. On average, over the long term, the stock market returns between 8 to 12% which is why so many of us do invest in the stock market because you can't get that kind of return from any other uh, financial vehicle. The general rule of thumb is that as you age, you want to reduce your risk to ensure you won't be eating cat food in your golden years. So when you're young, you can engage in a lot more risk as you are entering your 50s, you want to make sure that your risk is minimized because you want to be able to guarantee a certain amount of income for your retirement years. So there are two kinds of stock. We have common stock, and that is the vast majority of stock that's being issued. It allows for a non-guaranteed variable dividend and what that means is you could get it you might not get it it depends on the company and a variable dividend means that you are going to sometimes maybe get a dollar a share maybe five dollars a share they don't have to guarantee a certain amount and it also allows the shareholder to vote for the board of directors the other kind of share is a preferred stock and this again comes with the ownership in a company but it doesn't come with the same voting rights and the reason that somebody would get involved in a 
stock like this is because they're guaranteed a fixed dividend forever. So you don't get to vote, but you get a guaranteed dividend every year that you own that stock. Also, in the event of liquidation, i.e. the business closing, preferred shareholders are paid off before the common shareholder. So, for example, if you're someone who does not care about having any control over the management of the company, preferred stock is good because, in fact, you don't have to worry about any of that shareholder voting stuff. You just get your money every year. Now, when you buy and sell stocks, they're sold on exchanges in an auction-style system. And what that means is it's based on supply and demand. The more likely the stock will make money, the higher the cost of the stock. So in 2015, Google um, and its parent company, Alphabet, their stock sold for $690 a share. Disney sold for $94 a share. Facebook sells for $95 a share. Netflix, $104 a share. And finally, Amazon sells for $570 a share. So these extremely high share prices that Google and Amazon have are pretty rare. What you generally see for most successful companies is where you see Disney, Facebook, and Netflix. The most famous stock exchange is the New York Stock Exchange and its symbol NYSE. The second most well-known exchange in the U.S. is the NASDAQ. And you may hear these words if you listen to the news, NASDAQ up, NASDAQ down, um, which features many technology stocks such as Microsoft and Cisco. Other countries have their own stock exchanges. So you have the FTSE in London, the Shenzhen Stock Exchange in China. They also have the Shanghai Stock Exchange. China's got a pretty huge population, so um, they can support multiple stock exchanges. And then you have the Frankfurt Stock Exchange in Germany. And there are dozens of other um, because as a company improves, or as a country grows, uh, investment grows and people want to invest in those kinds of things. So here's a little basic idea of what supply and demand looks like in a mathematical way. So if more people want to buy a stock, i.e. demand, then sell it, supply, then the price moves up. Conversely, if more people want to sell a stock than buy it, there would be a greater supply than demand and the price would fall. So if you're looking at this picture, this is supply, and we always want supply, and here's demand, and this little area where they meet is price and quantity. This is the sweet spot. This is the pricing spot and how much you should sell. So right now we're dealing in a scenario where oil prices have been plummeting. It's because the supply far outstrips the demand right now. Um, China's economy is suffering, so their demand for oil has um, shrunk. The other issue is that right now the US and Saudi Arabia are engaged in kind of an underground battle with Russia to undermine the oil prices so really the only people who are making any money right now in, a, in an economy like that are the folks in Saudi Arabia and the countries that they deal with um, in the oil market uh, whereas Russia is getting squeezed out so you know there's a lot of geopolitical uh, stuff that goes on underneath everything we hear about on the news and so when you're paying a dollar fifty five or a dollar seventy five for gas know that it's a much more significant issue than just a little supply and demand so what else affects stock prices the number one thing earnings reports which reveal if the company has met or exceeded expectations versus if they fail to meet expectations. So a company that has been saying that it's going to have bon gonzo profits, 
Well, when they release the information, you find out they've had a significant loss. A lot of investors will say, you know what, this company is not being run well. I'm going to sell this stock and then go buy Google. The other thing that affects stock prices significantly can be the custom customer reaction to company news. In 2015, it was revealed that Volkswagen used technology to cheat on vehicle emissions testing, and that has had a significant impact on their stock price. In March 2015, before the scandal was revealed, Volkswagen was trading at $255 per share. In January 2016, after several months of the scandal being available for public consumption, we are now looking at $110 per share. So, you know, if a company really has done something that the public finds unethical, immoral, lying, cheating, stealing, all of that fun stuff, uh, they will respond by not buying that stock or selling it. Another aspect that you may have heard on the news occasionally are the idea of stock market indexes and they're used to monitor the behavior of a particular group of stocks. So some of the major indexes in the United States include the Dow Jones, Industrial Average, um, the S&P 500, that's Standard & Poor's 500 stocks, and the NASDAQ Composite. So for an individual investor, it is a general sign of the health of the stock market, not a specific sign. So we're going to look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It is 30 United States blue chip companies. And what blue chip means is the best of the best. So here they are and uh, in alphabetical order, and you'll see some very familiar companies, American Express, Apple, um, Coca-Cola, ExxonMobil, Home Depot, uh, McDonald's, Microsoft, and then everyone's favorite, Walt Disney. And these are the blue chip stocks that they look at to determine what the Dow Jones Industrial Average is. That's all it is. It's just an average. And it's a general idea if stock market is going up or going down. Here's a look at what the Dow Jones Industrial Average has done for about 33 years. And what you'll notice in 1980, the stock market Dow Jones Industrial Average was probably around 1500 and it was pretty stable. It jumped to 3000 in 1992, and that is shortly after Bill Clinton took over. Bill Clinton, despite being a Democrat and supposedly not good for business, uh, did a tremendous job increasing the stock market. He was president from 1992 to 2000, and here's the facts. The Clintons are very tied in with the banking industry, and as such, they made laws and passed regulations that allowed banks and other companies to expand and explore various options, which is why you see the Dow jumping from 3,000 up to almost 12,000 in eight years, which is just a staggering figure, and it demonstrates the health of the economy. Then in 2000, George W. Bush came in, and what you'll see is a deep decline in March 2002. And the reason for this is because in September 2001, 9-11 occurred, and the economy kind of halted for six to seven months. Um, people were very concerned about importing goods, we were very concerned about investing in anything. A lot of people were afraid the world was going to go into a giant war. And as such, you saw people hoarding their money into commodities that could be easily turned into cash, like gold. Then throughout the rest of George W. Bush's um, time in office, you saw it slowly beginning to rebuild. And then in 2008, you saw Obama come in and 
you also saw the fact that the recession hit. Um, and the recession, again, it was not Obama's fault. It had been beginning. It was mainly caused by the housing bubble, which uh, means that the houses were overvalued. And when the time came, people could not pay their mortgages. And as a consequence, um, it affected not only the United States economy, but a worldwide economic collapse. And we're going to talk about that in a lot more detail as the course moves on. And then as uh, we move into 2013 on this chart, what you see is the stock market has been steadily improving over the last several years. So let's talk about mutual funds because you hear, you know, are you in stocks, mutual funds, bonds, etc.? Well, a mutual fund is a collection of stocks and other securities rolled into one investment. They often focus on a particular segment of the economy. So they have a theme a lot of times, such as technology or um, companies that are very ethical or companies that are um, run by very religious people or companies that focus on health care. So mutual funds, if you do a little research, you can find a mutual fund that might potentially agree with your philosophy of life. The great thing about mutual funds is they diversify your risk, which means you have a reduced chance of losing money. So if you have some blue chip stocks with some risky stocks, it's kind of like adding a positive and a negative. It's going to bring your risk down a little bit. Now, many of you, and this is especially important for college students who are getting ready to graduate, when you get a job, you are going to be faced with making a decision to enroll in a 401k plan. This is a retirement savings plan sponsored by your employer. The great part of a 401k is it lets employees save and invest a piece of their paycheck before the taxes are taken out. The taxes are paid when you withdraw the money in your retirement. Now, what this does, it's twofold. First, you are taxed less today because let's say you're putting $4,000 into your 401k a year. Well, that's $4,000 less dollars you're being taxed on this year. Fast forward 50 years when you do retire, you're going to be in a different tax bracket because you're just paying income on your retirement income. So it's a great option. The other thing is many employers offer matching funds to encourage their employees to participate. It's part of your benefits package. So many of you will get health care. You'll get days off for sick days. You'll get vacation days. And then there's the 401k. That is just as important and just as vital as any of those other benefits. So, for example, if your employer provides a 4% match, then you should invest at least 4% to maximize how much you get from your employer. So, <clears throat> what that means is if that 4% of your paycheck is 100 bucks, that's just round numbers, that means your employer is also going to put 100 bucks into your 401k. That is free money. And if you don't take advantage of that, then somebody should come and pop you in the forehead. Nonprofit companies offer a similar program called a 403B. Now, why is one called a 401K and one is called a 403B? Well, it's the tax code. Ooh, ah. Nothing more than the, law, the number of the tax code that explains this stuff. Now, who controls your 401K? Technically, you control your 401K and how it's invested. Most plans offer a variety of funds that you can choose from. So, for example, you go to your first day on your job, you're getting your benefits package, you're signing up for your 401k, and they may give you 30 different mutual fund options to sign up for. Well, what you want to look at is administrative or management fees. 
that are charged on mutual funds because the company, not the company you work for, but the mutual fund company, for example, Fidelity or Berkshire Hathaway, are going to charge you for managing your money. You should choose funds that charge less than 1%. The reason for this is because 1% is about the average and if a fund is charging you way more than 1%, they better have an awesome return on investment. And we'll talk about return on investment in future classes. But if you have a company that's charging you 2% but the return on investment is 20%, yeah, that might be worth it. But if you're getting a mutual fund that's safe and sound with a 9% return on investment, make sure you are being charged less than 1%. And this becomes a very big issue as you begin to invest at the age of 21 or 22 because you're going to have that money sitting in an account for 40 years. The other thing to keep in mind is risk. So again, what you're going to look at is the return on investment and the risk associated with that. So, you know, there's a lot of things you have to keep in mind on that first day of your job, uh, the least of which is making sure that you take advantage of all of the opportunities to save money. So when can you actually get your money? So we love our 401ks or 403bs, but there are a few caveats. In most cases, you cannot access your money until you are 59 and a half. If you do need the money for something before you turn 59 and a half, you can incur a penalty of up to 30%. Some investment firms will allow you to borrow against your 401k, but you pay 18% interest at times. So you must be very cognizant that if you need to save money for other things such as um, a house, your kids college education, there are other investment vehicles that are not related to retirement that you can start investing in. Now for those of us who may not work for a company that has a 401k, we have an option to in engage in a individual retirement account or an IRA and this is very much like a 401k it's set up at a financial institution but it allows an individual to save for retirement without it being um, sponsored by the company these are aimed at people who cannot participate in a 401k or for people who have maxed out the matching contribution from their employer based plan and they will often choose to contribute to an IRA. So for example, let's say again you have a 4% match, you're putting that in, but you want to save more than that. Well, you can then put in more money into an IRA and you know maybe that IRA more closely aligns with your um, ethical choices or with your interests and so on and so forth. Like a 401k or a 403b, a person must be 59 and a half to withdraw their money. So again, this is a retirement account. It's not a save for my wedding account. There are three types of IRAs, the traditional, the Roth, and the rollover. A traditional IRA, you make the contributions with money that you are able to deduct on your tax return. And any earnings can potentially grow tax deferred until you withdraw them in retirement. So you pay the tax after you retire. And many retirees find, them, find themselves in a lower tax bracket than they were in pre-retirement. So the tax deferral means the money may be taxed at a lower rate. So if you're making $70,000 a year before you retire and then when you retire, that is cut in half between your investments and your Social Security, you're going to be taxed at a much lower rate than if you were being taxed at a $70,000 a year job rate. With a Roth IRA, you make contributions with money you've already paid the taxes on. So what that means is you've paid the tax on the amount you're investing. 
and then your money will grow tax free and when you retire you don't have to pay tax on that fund that Roth IRA this is especially good for young people because by the time they retire the money will have theoretically grown tremendously so if you invest a couple thousand dollars when you're 21 um, in a Roth IRA and you pay the tax on the two thousand dollars when you are 21 when you are 60 40 years later you may have fifteen twenty thousand dollars that you don't have to pay tax on so it's a great thing for somebody who is young a rollover IRA is a traditional IRA where the investment is rolled over from a qualified retirement plan so for example let's say that you have reached retirement age you worked at a company you have three or four different 401ks because you had three or four different jobs and instead of managing four or five different accounts you want to just move it all into an IRA so you roll it over and this allows you to manage it through one account and it basically makes life a little bit easier plus if you can find an IRA that charges way less administrative fees that is also going to be a huge benefit so why do you need a 401 1k or an IRA. In the US part of our paycheck is deducted for Social Security. That's where it says FICA. We receive Social Security when we retire and that usually begins around age 62 but the longer you wait to claim your Social Security the higher the amount is. The average monthly Social Security check in the United States right now 2015 2016 is about thirteen hundred dollars per month but the average family makes approximately forty two hundred a month and then you have to take that taxes out so let's say three thousand so where's the difference going to come from from three thousand to thirteen hundred well that's why you need your retirement savings your retirement savings will ensure that you're not living in a cardboard box eating cat food in the most pathetic way possible so you've often also may have heard the words bear and bull when referring to a market a bull market is when the economy is doing really well unemployment is low stock prices are rising and high consumer spending because if we are spending money that keeps the economy churning and churning and churning on the other hand a bear market is when the economy is doing poorly high unemployment stock prices are dropping a recession is imminent or already exists and consumer spending is very low right now we've been in a bull market we've had a few blips on the stock market because of what's going on with the economic problems in China but in general we've been seeing a really strong stock market the last few years so what should you do in a bear market people always freak out they're going oh my god I lost 30 percent of my savings because of the stock market last week well here's the reality you're in the stock market for the long term don't sell in a bear market because you're just gonna lose money so you hold your portfolio you stop looking at the stock prices and it will eventually improve it always does over time so whether you are investing in individual stocks mutual funds or retirement accounts you should look at it as a long-term commitment and again you know those of us who've seen the stock market go up and down we can look at our investments and say yeah I lost 30 percent of my savings in the last week but in the next five years I will rebound and again that's why risk is such an important element in investing because if you are a 60 year old you don't want to be in risky stuff that's going to drop your say your retirement account or your investments because you don't have that long to recover whereas when you're young you have a long time to recover so that finishes today's presentation if you have any questions always feel free to email or text me and have a terrific day